What do I see in the future? I see the nation state. And I see many European countries in decline, countries that have been in decline since 1914 and continue to decline. And I see one country rising, and I can say that I wrote about this four years ago, and this is Poland. When I said that Poland would emerge as a great power, I was laughed at uncontrollably, particularly by Poles, who know that there is no hope, and I should stop saying that there is any. Yet, look at the behavior of Poland economically, counter-cyclically to everything that's happening in Europe. This means something. It should be taken seriously. But we're also seeing the decay of NATO, and we're seeing the decay of the EU. As I said before, I may be completely in error. Please fix it, and I'll apologize. But assuming that you can't, let's talk about decay. We are now talking about regional blocks. Free trade can continue, it can be modified. But the question that really rests is what is the relationship between Germany and Russia? This is an old question and a dangerous one. Germany depends on Russian natural gas. Germany has a place to export technology. The Russians have money if you can find the bank they hid it in. So there is a relationship, an alternative for Germany. It is the historic alternative. It is one that Germany examined in the 1870s, had to deal with in the 1938-39 period. It is there. And what is also there is Poland. There are two things that I have to say to Poland. Poland has as its major national strategy looking for someone else to take care of it. This is not a national strategy, this is hope. Your latest hope is the EU. An entity that cannot even decide the most fundamental questions of solving this crisis you are looking to protect your national security from. It has no army. How will it protect you? It can't make decisions. Poland must now depend on itself. Why? It's a nation of 38 million. It has a vibrant economy. It has highly intelligent, educated people. And it is rising. I will put a more radical idea forward to you, which I think is fundamental, one that we get from General Pilsudski, the Intermarium. The Intermarium basically says we are caught between Germany and Russia, and that stinks. We would like to move to Sweden, but we can't. So we must become a very difficult morsel to swallow, and we can't become that ourselves. And he proposed the Intermarium, an alliance of nations between the Baltic and the Black Sea. Neither German nor Russian, but self-sufficient and then able to, in his mind, enter into a relationship with France. Because he knew that France could not come if Poland couldn't survive for six weeks, for more than six weeks. Enough time to be a morsel. How did Switzerland survive? It was easier not to attack it than to attack it. There are nations in Europe who have survived simply by being too much trouble fight with. Poland must become too much trouble. But Poland must also have a free trade zone with countries who need Polish exports, need to be aligned with Poland, need to be led by Poland. Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, even Turkey. All countries in crisis of various sorts. The interesting thing about Poland is you're not in crisis. When I look at the Euro Europe, everyone's a crisis. Poland isn't. There is a moment of leadership here that Poland can undertake in working with the United States to create a stable environment. An alliance with the United States from the Polish point of view consists of what will you give me that I don't have to pay for. That's not an alliance. An American alliance with Poland must be founded on the idea of Poland as a self-sufficient leader in the region that the United States can rely on. We are not France. We will come, but you have to be here. If you all move to Sweden, there's nothing we can do. This last piece is advice that sounds archaic. How can you speak of General Pilsudski? How can you think of the Intermarium? How can you think of Polish leadership? The answer is, how can I not? When I see what has happened to NATO, when I see what has happened to the European Union, when I see how Poland is developing, how can I not think this way? Europe is returning to history. The great party is over. 91 to 2008 was wonderful. It will not return. A future now has to be made, and for 2,000 years, the future of Europe was built on states. You are living in one of the most dynamic and important states of Europe, and you can help shape it, not by writing position papers and going to meetings, but far more importantly, by taking steps to protect your sovereignty and to assert your power. It is not that what I am saying is archaic. It was that the period of 1991 and 2008 was an anomaly. It was not real. It merely happened and now is over. I urge you to stop waiting for the good times to come back. <laughs>
and to take responsibility for the country you love and whose fate you share in returning to history. But the first thing you have to do, as much as you love Poland, is to believe in it. And the hardest thing to do in America is to convince an American there's anything that's beyond his reach. But in Poland, I must convince you that there's something within your reach. Step back, take a look at your country, take a look at the chaos around you in Europe, and take control of your fate. This is what the next 50 years will look like. It will look like Poland and other countries committed to their people, to those they love, and making their way. It is a very painful history, but there's no pain that I can tell Poland it will bear that will be worse than what it did. So, history continues, and you will be a leading power in it. You don't believe it, but it's true. The idea is that those of you who live in the European Peninsula share a common identity, of which that's certainly true. You all live in the European Peninsula. You are divided by language. You are divided by history. But all of those are not as important as the fact that you are divided by interest. The interest of a Greek in this moment is not the same as an interest of a German. I'm enough of a Marxist, which is not much of a Marxist, <laughs> to believe that when the political questions on unification are asked, there are details to be answered. And the Europeans, no matter how broad an understanding they have of what it means to be European, something that Nietzsche believed, something that Kant believed, something that has been a part of European culture, when it comes to answering the question, what does that mean that we're part of a European nation? It is difficult to build a nation. We had a civil war and hundreds of thousands died. And even now, the work of creating a nation is underway. I don't see Europe making the difficult, agonizing choices of nation building. I don't see the shared values. There are shared principles, but the shared values will mean, look, I may be German, but that doesn't make me different from a Greek. So I may be Texan, but that doesn't make me different from a New Yorker beyond cultural things. And the federal government takes my taxes and distributes it as it wants anyway. When you reach that point, then I think this conversation becomes interesting. The conversation of being a European becomes interesting when it hurts, and it's done anyway. Culturally, yes, you're European. And as I, as a Hungarian, know, I can understand every European if I know Hungarian. No, I can't. <laughs> but I think there is a European idea. Translating it into a European reality is not something that will simply happen. It will be very painful, and I'm not seeing Europe being prepared to bear the pain. I may be wrong, we'll see.